have to read from, this is a kind of a nerve-wracking thing because no one's, not even Janie, this is brand new. I know, I'm just writing this right now. This is not published. And, you know, it's, it's my, you know, sequel to Falling Angel, which, um, you know, it's called Burning Angel. It's unpublished. And, uh, oh, wait a minute. What is this? Burning Angel? It's published. Oh. It's by James Lee Burr. I'm not James Lee Burr. What's this? Well, the story about this is like, I've been planning in my mind to write a, this sequel to Falling Angel. And the title Burning Angel was, of course, obvious to me from the start. I may have told a few people. Anyway, at the library book sale one year, there this was, you know, and I went, holy moly, I'm doomed, you know. So I, and I, and I just bought it, and last October at the um, Missoula, the book festival, James Lee Burke was one of the featured readers, so I had this book with me, and I went up to him, and he graciously signed it. I told him my little tale of woe, and he basically said, oh, hell, I don't care, go ahead and use it, you know, because you can't really copyright a title. But I said, but... Mr. Burke, you don't get it. You, you know, you're like a famous guy. And if I used your title, everyone would think I ripped you off. So, so I have another title, but I'm not telling anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not putting it out into the atmosphere to clear the deal. So now I have now I'm gonna I have a couple of caveats, and 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 they are, first of all, what I'm about to read is full of obscenities and is extremely violent. So if anyone doesn't like that kind of stuff, you best take a powder. <laughs> the other thing is, I don't know how many of you have either not read this book, probably lots, but or not seen the Alan Parker movie Angel Heart. And if anybody hasn't done either one of those, there's going to be a bit of a spoiler here. And I'm hoping you're all a little bit familiar with it so I won't have to give that much backstory. Okay, I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> so basically, what the story is, uh, it's a it's a mystery. See, so I'm going to because I'm going to start by reading the last chapter of Falling Angel and then and glide into this what, how it begins. But so the, basically, the story is uh, once upon a time, a private detective named Harry Angel is hired via a Wall Street attorney named Herman Weinsack to find a, a, a missing World War II crooner named Johnny Favor. And the guy that wants him found is called Louis Cipher. He's also known as Dr. Cipher, Louis Cipher. He has many, and El Cipher. You know, he's this mysterious guy, very elegant, and, you know, has, in the movie, has ever elongating fingernails. <laughs> Robert De Niro. Yeah. And, 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 and along the way, the detective, who's a completely logical kind of detective guy, gets lured into the world of metaphysics, first through voodoo, and then into black magic, none of which he believes in. It's all hooey to him. But, you know, he, he and there's mur everybody he talks to so turns up dead. And the cops start thinking he's the guy that did it, since he was the last person to be seen with the person that's murdered. And along, okay, so, okay, so there, I just want to tell you a few things so you'll know who's who when I... So there's a, there's a guy named Cruzmark, who's a big shipping magnate. And his daughter, Margaret, is a kind of palm reader, uh, you know, mystic, and uh, was a girlfriend of Johnny Favorites. She gets found murdered with her heart cut out. Oh. And, 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 and John, uh, Harry Angel goes into his office with a Minox camera, photographs all of his paperwork, you know, in his fancy office in the Chrysler building, and also finds an invitation to a black mass in a subway station, abandoned subway. Unlike the movie, the whole book takes place in New York. And so there's this black mass in the subway station, and so he's going to go there. And also along the way, he, he interviews a, a, a jazz pianist named uh, Toot Sweet, Edison <laughs> Toot Sweet, and, and who gets murdered. But, but he finds out that, that, that Johnny Favorite had an affair with a kind of voodoo mama queen named Evangeline Proudfoot, and her daughter, Epiphany Proudfoot, runs a kind of herb shop in Harlem. And along the way, Harry has, starts up an affair with this 17-year-old girl. Who, who, you know, so, so all of this has happened. and So he's down there, and there's the black mass, and he, he's got to 
you know, tri -X film. He takes all these pictures, and cruise mark is there, and it's part of the whole baby's throat gets cut. There's a lot of, you know, horrible sexual activity. And so he con confronts cruise mark, you know, on the way up the subway tunnel, and, and basically tells him, you know, he, he handcuffs him and says, you know what, I've got all this film, I'm just going to mail it in to somebody, and, and unless you tell me what's going on. And then Kruzmark tells him all this story about how Johnny Favorite was a, you know, a vegetable in a hospital, and his daughter persuaded him to like bribe the hospital. They take him out of the hospital, and they let him go on Times Square on New Year's Eve, 1943, and that's the last time he ever saw him. And his dog tags are in a canopic urn in his daughter's, you know, apartment. And then he wants the film, and Harry won't give him the film. They get into a fight, and Harry knocks him out, and he falls on the third rail, and he's dead. So that's Kruzmark. And so Harry then goes to Margaret Kruzmark's apartment. It's all taped off with police tape because she had her heart cut out a couple days ago. You know, no one's supposed to go in there. But he's got a set of twirls, as he calls them. Those are like, like skeleton keys, and he's in. And he goes to the canopic urn, and he breaks it open, and the name of the soldier that was whose heart was eaten in a kind of diabolical ceremony, supposedly, that would transfer souls back and forth. And, and the, the name of the soldier uh, that Johnny Favorite ate the heart of was Harold Angel. And so he's just in a turmoil, and he stumbles out, and he's got these dog tags, and he goes back to his office, and Cypher is waiting for him, knocks him unconscious, and basically is broken into his safe, taken evidence, has got his pistol, and leaves. And um, he rises downstairs thinking he'll get there before the elevator. The elevator is very slow, but the elevator door opens, and Cypher's not in the elevator. And then he searches the building, and nobody's there. And the last line of the previous chapter goes, by the time I thought to call Epiphany, it was too late. So this is the last chapter now. A falling angel. The endless ringing struck the same note of despair as the lonely voice of the Spanish sailor in Dr. Cipher's bottle. Another lost soul like me. I sat for a long time with my ear to the receiver, surrounded by the desolate trash heap wreckage in my office. My mouth was dry and tasted of ashes. All hope was gone, abandoned. I had crossed the threshold of doom. After a while, I got up and stumbled down the stairs to the street. I stood on the corner of the crossroads of the world and wondered which way to go. It didn't matter anymore. I had run long enough, and far, I'd lo run long and far enough. I was all through running. I spotted a cruising crab, cab heading east on 42nd and flagged it down. Any special address? The driver's sarcasm broke along in moody silence. My words sounded far away, like someone else speaking. Hotel Chelsea on 23rd Street. We turned downtown on 7th, and I slouched in the corner and stared out at a world gone dead. In the distance, fire trucks howled like raging demons. We passed the hulking columns of Penn Station, gray and somber in the lamplight. The driver didn't speak. Under my breath, I hummed a Johnny Faber tune, popular during the war. It was one of my biggest hits. Poor old Harry Angel, fed to the dogs like table scraps. I killed him and ate his heart, but it was me who died all the same. Not even magic and power can change that. I was living on borrowed time in another man's memories, a corrupt hybrid creature trying to escape the past. I should have known it was impossible. No matter how cleverly you sneak up on a mirror, your reflection always looks you straight in the eye. Been some excitement around here tonight, the driver pulled to a stop across from the Chelsea where three squad cars and a police ambulance were double parked. He flipped up the flag on his meter. 160, please. I paid with my emergency 50 and told him to keep the change. This ain't no five, mister. You made a mistake. Many mistakes, I said, and hurried across the pavement, the color of gravestones. A patrolman was talking on the desk phone in the lobby, but he let me pass without a glance. 
Three black, fried regular, one tea with lemon, he said as the elevator door slid closed. I got off at my floor. A wheeled stretcher sat in the hall. Two attendants slouched against the wall. Why all the rush, one of them complained. They knew they had a stiff on their hands the whole time. My apartment door stood wide open. A flashbulb popped inside. The smell of cheap cigars filled the air. I strolled in without a word. Three uniformed cops paced around with nothing to do. Sergeant Demos sat at the table with his back to me, giving my description to someone on the telephone. Another flashbulb went off in the bedroom. I had a look inside. One was enough. Epiphany lay face up on the bed, wearing only my dog tags, tied by her wrists and ankles to the frame with four ugly neckties. My hammerless Smith and Wesson protruded between her outspread legs, the snub barrel inserted like a lover. Her womb's blood glistened on her open thighs, bold as roses. Lieutenant Stern was one of five plain posed detectives, watching with his hands in his overcoat pockets as the photographer knelt for a close-up. Who the hell are you? A patrolman asked behind me. I live here. Stern looked at my direction, his sleepy eyes widened. Angel? Disbelief cracked his voice. That's the guy, collar him. The cop behind me pinned my arms. I didn't resist. Save the heroics, I said. See if he's healed, Stern barked. The other cops looked at me like I was an animal in the zoo. A pair of cuffs bit into my wrists. The cop frisked me down and pulled the Colt commander from the waistband of my pants. Heavy artillery, he said, handing it to Stern. Stern glanced at the gun, checked the safety, and set it on the bedside table. Why'd you come back? No place else to go. Who is she? Stern jerked his thumb at Epiphany's body. My daughter. Bullshit. Sergeant Demos sauntered into the bedroom. Well, well, what have we here? Demos, call downtown and tell him we've got the suspect in custody. Right away, the sergeant said, strolling from the room in no particular hurry. Give it to me again, Angel. Who's the girl? Epiphany Proudfoot. She runs an herb shop on 123rd in Lexington, and Lennox. One of the other detectives wrote it down. Stern shoved me back into the living room. I sat on the couch. How long you been shacking up with her? A couple days. Just long enough to kill her, right? Look what we found in the fireplace. Stern picked up my charred horoscope by the remaining unburnt corner. Want to tell us about it? No. Doesn't matter. We got all we need unless that's not your 38 stuck up or snatch. It's mine. You'll burn for this, Angel. I'll burn in hell. Maybe, but we'll be sure to give you a head start upstate. Shark's, Stern's shark slit mouth widened into an evil smile. I stared at his yellow teeth and remembered the laughing face painted on Steeplechase Park. A joker's grin, expanding with malice. There was only one other smile like it, the evil leer of Lucifer. I could almost hear his laughter fill the room. This time, the joke was on me. So that, that's how that began. Now.